Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Or afternoon. I, I don't have a clue what time you're listening to this. Let's get into it. Episode number 113. Some business first. We have uh, two sponsors for today's episode. The first sponsor is Duke Cannon. What is Duke Cannon, you might ask yourself? Well, I would describe it as a high-quality grooming products company. Duke Cannon's superior quality grooming goods are for hardworking men, and I'm going to say women too, and it's tested by soldiers. They partner with active duty military to develop their new ideas and review their products. And if anything doesn't meet the high standards of those soldiers, then it's not actually going to happen. I personally, and I think you will, enjoy opening up American-made products. They're as functional as they are fun. And yes, Duke Cannon really does put beer and bourbon in their soap because this is America and you can. I think it's my favorite bar of soap, actually, the beer and bourbon. And right now they have the beer and bourbon box of big ass bricks of soap. That's a freaking mouthful. Say that four times in a row. It's 25 bucks. You're going to get four 10 ounce American made soaps. The big ass beer soap made with fresh squeezed Deschutes IPA. I don't know what any of that means, but they say it's woodsy citrus scent. I mean, I don't know here. I'm a sommelier, and I'll make the decision. I'll need to go smell this, and I'll get back to you. Then there's the big American bourbon soap made with Buffalo Trace, two oak barrel scented bricks, and the big-ass beer soap made with Old Milwaukee premium American lager that has a sandalwood scent and a fine, smooth finish. They sent me all these bars of soap. I actually really enjoy them. They're freaking massive, and I have no idea how long a bar of soap should last actually. But this thing is about the size of a McNear Common red brick. It's huge, and it lasts me a long time. That's all I can really say about that. Even more, though, than the smell of the product and how much I enjoy using it, I like the fact that Duke Cannon is committed to giving back to the men and women serving our country. 5% of their net profits are donated to causes benefiting veterans and active duty military. So don't be surprised if you're using a do Cannon, big ass brick of soap, and you start humming the national anthem. Here's the offer for the listeners get 15% off your first order at dukecannon.com when you use the promo code cleared hot. And the way I'm looking at that is it's all uppercase, all one word. Please, uh, plus, free shipping on orders over $35. dukecannon.com, promo code cleared hot. Second sponsor of the episode is one that I've been talking about pretty frequently in the recent past. It is Feels. Feels is a CBD company, and I get asked in person, actually, quite a bit about this and over email. There's a variety of uses for CBD, and for myself, I use it pretty much for, I would say, pain management because I am not a fan of taking... Pills, whether it be over-the-counter, aspirin, uh, Tylenol, Aleve, fill in the blank. I, I just don't like taking those things. And one of the reasons I don't is if I take it on even a moderately empty stomach, for whatever reason, for me, I will start having uh, stomach issues. I'll get an upset stomach, and it actually kind of jacks up my day. Having said that, you can use it for stress or anxiety, uh, and I also have used it for sleeping. So... Feels. What is Feels? This company is a premium CBD that is delivered directly to your doorstep. It helps to naturally reduce stress, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness. This particular product is sublingual. So you place a few drops of Feels under your tongue and you will feel the difference within minutes. And that's one thing that I can say in addition to not enjoying taking pills, I also didn't like the lag time from traditional pills until they started taking effect. When I take a dose of CBD, and I think it's probably important to talk about this at this point, I'm no doctor, and I would recommend for people that you experiment with your dosage to find the right one for you. Feels offers a variety of products that come in different dosages. I take a little bit more than was initially recommended to me, but when I do take it, I'd say less than five minutes, I start feeling the effects, whether that's for pain management or if I'm trying to wind down for the evening, I personally will take a touch uh, more than I would for pain management, and I really start to feel the impact pretty rapidly. I enjoy it. So you place it on your tongue, and you're going to feel that difference within minutes. 
And if you're new to CBD, Feels offers a free CBD hotline and text message support to help guide you on that personal experience. And it should vary by person, in my opinion. Feels works naturally to help you feel better. There's no high, there's no hangover, and there's no addiction. You can join the Feels community to get Feels delivered to your door every month. You'll save money on every order, and you can pause or cancel at any time. So the offer for the listeners. Feels definitely has me feeling my best every day, and it can help you too. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash cleared hot, and you will get 50% off your first order with free shipping. That is F-E-A-L-S, Foxtrot Echo Alpha Lima Sierra dot com slash cleared hot to become a member and get 50% off automatically taken off your first order with free shipping. Feels.com slash cleared hot. All right, that's it for the business side of the house for this episode. My guest for episode number 113 is myself. And if you can't tell already, I'm a little bit sick and my voice sounds a little bit nasally. I apologize. Please don't send me any emails telling me that you don't like the sound of my voice because right now I can't do anything about it. Episode 113 is going to be a little bit of a debrief and a cleanup from the previous episode, episode 112 with Eddie Gallagher, because the feedback and the response from that episode was very interesting to me. And I think that it creates a wedge with which we can have further and more complex conversations. And I think we need to take that opportunity and dive into those things. So let us begin episode 113 with me. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. I'm all winning, baby. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Can't be cleared hot. Okay, let's dive right into this. So, last week, last Monday, I launched episode 112 with Eddie Gallagher, uh, retired Navy SEAL. Recognizable, as I mentioned in the podcast description, probably from the national coverage that his um, court-martial and subsequent intervention by the President of the United States received. Before I sat down with the episode with Eddie, I had never met him. So when he knocked on the hotel room door and we opened it, we met each other for the first time. We basically dove right into the conversation. I think we BSed for maybe five minutes before. Uh, And for those of you who are wondering where the YouTube video was for that episode, let me let you in on a little secret. I am an idiot. And uh, if you didn't know that, you do now. I think I say it all the time. You should probably take me at face value on that one. I turned on the video camera and then closed the viewfinder, which in case anybody else uh, wants to avoid making that mistake, don't do that. Because when I did that, it turned off the camera about five seconds later. So I have one five-second clip of us basically getting ready to talk. And that's why it wasn't on YouTube. But I digress. We talked for three hours about his situation, and I knew that going into the conversation, the response that I would get to the conversation was going to vary depending on the opinion and potentially bias of the individuals listening to that episode, and that proved to be very true. There was some very interesting social media commentary that came from that, and I'm going to dive into that because I believe it leads us to the conversations that we should be having. But one interesting thing that I I guess I was surprised about, and maybe I shouldn't have been, is that there were people complaining about me giving him a platform. There was, you know, comments from how could you or why would you? And, you know, I had respect for you before you gave this individual that platform. And I don't uh, I don't take any of the comments personally, but they it's it's curious to me that people would say that. Um Whether you like somebody or not, or believe in somebody or not, at least my personal opinion is, is that every single person has the right to speak for themselves and to have their story at least known. Um, People who listen to this podcast, you can vote with your time. If you don't want to listen to somebody's story, then skip the episode. Or if you don't like me for the fact that I had somebody on, I think the unsubscribe button is the same one as subscribe. Because I am who I am, and I try to be very upfront and honest with that. And I'm going to be who I'm going to be. And you can either choose to listen or not. The choice is up to you, but it's not up to you as to whether or not somebody else has the right to tell their story. 
You don't have to agree with somebody to agree that they should at least have a platform. A lot of the people who made that initial comment with, you know, how could you or how would you opened with, this is a guilty man, he's a war criminal. Or the other side of that coin is, this man's a hero and he's a warrior. Now, I'm going to focus more on the people who came to me saying that he is guilty and that he was a war criminal. The reality is, is that he was found not guilty and he was not committed or convicted of a war crime. He was found guilty of Article 134 of the UCMJ. And I know that the the narrative is sexier, if you can say war crimes, but the objective truth is that's not the case. And for people who come at me with that, my question back to them, and this is where it becomes difficult interfacing with people on social media, and actually probably even harder for people listening to me now because this is completely one way, me talking to people. But if I could get those people in a room, what I would ask them, the ones who say, no, he was guilty, what I would ask them is, obviously you would have accepted a guilty verdict. Or I would say, would you have accepted a guilty verdict from the jury of his peers? And I suspect they would have said yes. If you say yes to that, how can you not accept a not guilty verdict? If you don't trust the process when it returns a verdict that you don't agree with, we aren't actually talking about the process. We're talking about your opinion and your personal beliefs. You're picking and choosing. You're choosing to ignore the result of the proceeding because it doesn't fit with your personal beliefs or narratives. You would only trust the process if it netted you the result that you wanted. And that's not how it works. So if you would have accepted a guilty verdict, you also have to accept a not guilty verdict, in my opinion. And this comes to or ties to conviction of belief, because some of these people are had an immense amount of passion and conviction, which I respect in their beliefs. But conviction of belief and passion for your beliefs is in no way, shape, or form connected to or associated with the accuracy or validity of your beliefs. When I was younger, I believed in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy. And that didn't mean that they were real. And there are people on earth right now that are devoting their lives to the belief that the earth is flat and that Bigfoot is real. And I actually respect that level of passion and commitment. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with that particular belief set, but I respect that level of passion and commitment But I also understand, and I hope that they understand at some level, that that passion and commitment doesn't mean that they're correct. The reason I think the conversation with Eddie is so important is that I hope that it leads to further conversations. And people have asked me directly, how common is it that SEALs would report on each other? And the answer that I have after 17 years in the community, is that it depends. I have seen, with my own eyes, commands, military commands, treat people with exceptional fairness. But I've also seen commands treat people with exceptional unfairness and with bias and with prejudice. I've seen, with my own eyes, personal and professional grudges play themselves out inside of operational units. I can't think of a single team that I was a part of where everybody was in just lockstep key formation with their beliefs and ideologies and their personal and professional lives were just everybody was commensurate in the direction that they were going. Every single team that I've been a part of, there has been grading of at least personalities to some level. So I've seen those things play themselves out, grudges. But I've also seen personal and professional grudges completely put aside for the greater good. So I've seen those teams struggle, and I've seen them function well. I have seen actions reported, actions taken from SEALs, reported by other SEALs, and I've also seen actions swept underneath the rug. I've seen the community self-correct, and I've seen the community kick the most insidious, horrendous, acidic, 
cancerous cans down the street and refuse to deal with them. So when it comes to this whole situation and the conversation that I had with Eddie, I have zero answers. What I have are further questions. But the only way to answer those questions is to continue the dialogue. And I don't know if that episode answered more questions for people or it created more. And I don't care as long as it continues the conversation. And I think it's important for people to understand that I will sit and I will talk with people on both sides of any issue, people that agree with me and people that disagree with me. I want to talk with people on both sides of the issue. It's not that I will, because I will. It's in addition to that, I actually want to. The invitation is open, but the choice to do so is on those individuals. I hope it was the first conversation many. Uh, It has to start somewhere, and hopefully that conversation, those three hours, that was the start. And that's enough about the previous episode. I want to talk more about the direction that the commentary that came from it can take us. So let's talk about that. There were some individuals that came out guns blazing. They at least appeared to me, and I would suspect many others, that they, they just knew that everything about it was bullshit. And I noticed some interesting patterns. The first pattern is, is that they refused to listen or let alone even consider opposing information. They also, for whatever reason, tied in comments about President Trump, not from the perspective of him and his involvement in the case, but his character and their uh, lack of satisfaction with the fact that he happens to currently be the president. When I get comments from people like that, I try to interact. And I try to, anytime that I'm interacting on social media, on any platform, or in person, I try to follow my elevator rule. And I know I've talked about this before, but people ask me about it, so I will review the elevator principle that I have, specifically for social media. I will not make a comment on social media that I would feel uncomfortable making in an elevator with the person that I am commenting to with the door shut and the elevator malfunctioned. Basically, a face-to-face rule. If I wouldn't say it directly to your face, I will not say it to you on social media because I believe that social media comments actually have consequences in the real world. And I think if more people thought like that, it would change the dialogue quite a bit. So when I encounter people like this who are unwilling to move their position and they are just so passionate about what they believe, it actually leaves me as an individual with only one option. And that option, unfortunately, is at some point I have to ignore you because you are operating from a position and a place of emotion, not logic. And I don't fault those people for who they are and how they're behaving, but I recognize that a rational conversation is not possible So I have to stop engaging with them at some point. I always do my best to uh, understand opposing positions, but everything has its limits. And my limits are reached much more rapidly when I'm engaging with someone driven by emotion and not knowledge or experience. And I don't know if people realize this, but if you're actually willing to be malleable in your beliefs and receptive to other people's opinion and information and actually take it on board and process it and then engage with them in a logical perspective, you might actually change their opinion to be more towards yours. But when you come in from an unmovable position, all you're actually doing is you're pushing people away from you and you're driving people farther away from where you actually want them to land with your beliefs. Now, some of the specific comments, there's four that I, that I want to address because I find them to be interesting, and again, they lead us to a greater conversation. So in no particular order, the four comments that I think are worth discussing at a deeper level. Soldiers are only fighting for the petrodollar. There have been no attacks on U.S. soil since Pearl Harbor. When was the last time your freedoms were actually threatened? And soldiers are not dying for my freedom. Let's start with the uh, last one, and I think we'll work our way towards the top. Everything I say from here on out, for clarity, is completely my opinion. I only speak for myself. I don't speak for any greater organization, and these opinions are based on my own personal experiences. So take them for a grain of salt, or tell me to go pack sand. Your choice. 
Soldiers don't die for my freedom, and soldiers don't die for my rights. You are correct. In my opinion, when a soldier dies, they are not providing you any of the freedoms that we are so incredibly lucky to have in this country. And I say that because our freedoms are or were guaranteed and preserved in the founding documents of this nation. And no soldier alive today or in the generation previous to the ones alive today or the generation before that or before that was actually involved with that process. I, having said that, I wrote uh, a blog post a couple years ago uh, when a SEAL was killed from my old command, and it was titled, A Debt That Cannot Be Repaid. And I actually reposted this a few days ago. And some of these comments come from the comment section as people had shared this. But one of the things from that post that rings the truest to me is the following. Paper may outline the foundation and principles of this nation, but it is blood that protects it. So although our freedoms are guaranteed and preserved in the founding documents of this country, that document in and of itself can do nothing. It's not going to stop a bullet. It's not going to stop a tank. And unless there are people willing to go put their toes on the line in a variety of capacities, that document has no power because words don't protect anything. Now, there's obviously been attacks on U.S. soil since Pearl Harbor, 9-11 being probably the most concrete and visible example of that, but it goes beyond that. And in my opinion, it is actually getting more dangerous, not less dangerous when it comes to attacks on U.S. soil. So before I get into that, though, let's talk about Pearl Harbor. That was a massive military force, a national military force. They had robust planning. They had to mobilize, and the attack itself was executed by a very large military force. Now, I say it's getting more dangerous because the attacks of the modern era, they don't require any of that. And I think beyond 9-11 itself, the best example of that is probably what happened in San Bernardino in 2015. There was a husband and wife. The husband was a U.S.-born individual. The wife was Pakistani-born, but she had a U.S. green card. Um, And they had access to an ideology that is directly opposed to the founding ideologies of this country. They did not have access to a military force, but they had unfettered access to information. And with that and through that information, they became radicalized and executed an attack and killed 14 people, and injured 22 more. Now, I don't want to reduce the value of human life to a simple number, because I believe it is much more complex than that, but for a moment, to make a point, I'm going to do that. So, let's talk about Pearl Harbor again. There were 2,403 military personnel killed, and shockingly, in that number, 1,177 of those were on the USS Arizona which is insane. I wish I could explain to people how big these vessels actually are. They're floating cities. Um, it's crazy that nearly half of those people killed were on just one, uh, one massive boat. Now, that attack was carried out by 353 Imperial Japanese aircraft that launched from two waves from six Japanese aircraft carriers. And again, I hate reducing life to just pure numbers, but bear with me for a second. Each one of those Imperial Japanese bombers was, by the numbers, responsible for 6.8 U.S. soldiers per plane. So let's roll this forward into 2015. San Bernardino, two people, 14 individuals killed, 22 injured. Seven people per terrorist killed, 11 people per terrorist injured. And let's roll back even farther. 9-11, 2,977 victims with 19 hijackers. That means each of those hijackers was responsible for 156 people dying. Does anybody want to make the argument to me that information and ideologies are not incredibly dangerous? In my opinion, they're much more dangerous than a military force. I think the risk to this country from a mobilized military force in the modern world is almost non-existent. But the threat to the ideologies and the ability to 
weaponize those ideologies is increasing because we live in an age where information has no borders, but human beings can use borders to isolate and hide themselves while they plan and create and disseminate the most insidious and hateful information and ideologies possible. That begs the question, what do we do? If those ideologies are dangerous and are trending to be more dangerous than mobilized military forces, what do we do as a nation? And this leads me to some of the bigger questions that I think should be brought to the forefront when we talk about things like the Eddie Gallagher case. You know, are we fighting for the right reasons? Some of the comments to go back to the petrol dollar. My answer to that question is yes. Some people disagree. You know, and when it comes directly to the uh, you know soldiers are fighting for the petro dollar comment, I'll agree with you. There are individuals and organizations that have made billions on the enterprise of war. Of that, there is zero doubt to me. And there are individuals and organizations in office and under the guise of public service service that in reality exist only to serve themselves and their bottom line. And of that, there's also zero doubt to me. So are soldiers serving and fighting for them? The truest, or not truest, the fairest answer would be that the opinions are going to vary between individuals. But from my personal experience, I never felt even the slightest hint or touch of that influence. But my job was a little bit different than those for most people in the military. My job was based around the philosophy of finding the individuals responsible or directly tied to creating, promoting, distributing those insidious ideologies. So we find them and we go to their country and you go to their town and you go to their house and you go to their room and you fucking kill them. This fight, that fight that I just described to you is global. Actions like what I just described are in various phases of execution all over the world, most of them in non-petrol based companies. So if you think you're fighting for only, or if you think we are fighting for only oil, it's very possible that you don't understand the breadth and depth of U.S. military involvement around the world and how the net, if you will, of protection for this country is interwoven through those actions. Are there going to be people who profit on that? Yes, there are. Absolutely. But those actions are absolutely essential. Now, I realize my experiences are anecdotal, but I am the wrong person to ask when was the last time that my rights or fe- uh, freedom felt threatened? I'm just, I'm not a good person to answer that because I feel like it's likely that I've had them more directly threatened than most. The last time that I truly felt my freedom was in jeopardy was the last time I locked eyes with one of those people that I have described. And I'll say this about them. They're not superhuman and they don't have any special powers and They're made of the same parts and pieces that we all are, and they are the purest sense of evil I have ever encountered in my life. You can feel it when they look at you, and by that I mean you can feel it in your bones. And I don't ever want anyone to have to experience that. And the only way to ensure that they don't experience that is to take those people off of the board. It's a good thing that people question whether or not their freedoms are in jeopardy. I say that because it means that they're not feeling a direct threat, which means that the people who are tasked with keeping that threat at bay are doing their job. But it should also be viewed with caution, in my opinion, because I don't want people to take their freedoms and their rights for granted either. There are nameless and faceless, until they die, men and women out there who are hunting, and that's the best and only description that I think actually captures it. They're hunting evil, and we need them now more than most people may realize. Speaking of these men and women, let's allow all this over here just for a moment and talk a little bit about what recently happened. I think it was last week. Kobe Bryant, the juxtaposition between the nameless and the faceless and a celebrity. Obviously, I'm assuming most people hear this realize that Kobe Bryant, along with his daughter and many others, were killed in a helicopter crash. This immediately made national news, and it flooded social media. Almost as rapidly as Kobe Bryant's death made the national news and flooded social media, some veterans started posting 
articles about military members dying in helicopter crashes and admonishing people for caring more about Kobe Bryant than the troops. Those posts were some of the most tasteless and classless, and they're not going to age well. Those are not going to be a fine red wine. The longer that those stay up, the worse that they are going to look. And it, what sucks about it even more is that that post, the one that was most commonly shared, was from a crash that occurred 15 years ago. So incredibly petty to bring that back up in the face of somebody else losing their life. So to the vets that made those posts, I have a few requests. The first one is, do me a favor. Do the veteran community a favor. Get over yourself. Kobe Bryant was one of the most famous sports stars to ever walk the face of the earth. And yes, he played a game for a living and made hundreds of millions of dollars bouncing a ball. Yes, some of his actions in the past certainly sounded utterly horrific and fall short of what anybody would want or expect from a role model. But in spite of that, he reached millions of people, actually probably billions of people around the globe, given how popular basketball is. And those people loved him. And yes, they'd never met him, but he inspired them. He connected with them in some way. He was a public figure, and his death was treated like he was a public figure. If you join the military wanting to or expecting to be treated like a public figure, then you joined completely blind. It is an occupation by its definition of service and sacrifice. In zero spotlight. It's not, in my opinion, that the American public and news organizations don't care. It's that servicemen and women are unknown to everybody except their friends and family until they die. Kobe's life is not worth more than a soldier's life. He is just known by so many more. And on that note, a soldier's life is not worth more than Kobe's life. And I think that is what bothered me the most about those posts, an attempt to value one life over another. Or the quality and quantity of attention, care, and mourning from one death over the death of another. And it was also incredibly hypocritical. Law enforcement officers, fire, first responders, they die nearly every day. Why am I not seeing these same veterans post about those first responders every time that a celebrity dies? And the answer is simple. The vets who posted those, I don't think I can call it a meme, I'd call it an article. They don't care enough to post about the LEO, the first responder, or the firefighters. Actually, I take that back. I'm sure that they do care. It's just that they care about themselves more. And that's actually what the posts were about. They were about you. The what about me, what about us mentality of, you know, well, what about our deaths? What about our service? It was so ridiculously classless. I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. The biggest threat to the veteran community is veterans themselves. If, as a veteran, you want people to respect you and your military service and the military in general, don't demand it from the people. Don't demand it from our society. Earn it. If you want their respect, act respectable. I wish people cared as much about soldiers as Kobe too, but that's not the world that we live in, and that's not what you signed up for. So next time, before you consider posting in anger or frustration, go for a ride in your car with your custom veteran license plate and your Mullen Labe stickers on the back window, and go to Starbucks and fill up your custom Punisher Skull coffee cup, have a few sips, and then just don't. Let people grieve however they see fit, and we live in a country where people get to choose, and that's what we were actually fighting for. So stop bitching about people's choices. So now that I've gone completely down a rabbit hole, I don't even know how the hell I ended up on that, I'm going to wrap it up and go back to kind of what I opened with. I think that the commentary leads us in a direction where deeper questions should be asked, and I hope that there's an environment where we can facilitate conversation. <clears throat> to me, the questions that I think that we should be asking when situations like Eddie's come to the surface, because Eddie's situation was not the first, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be the last. As long as this country is involved in conflict and combat, 
throughout the globe, things like this are going to happen. And I hope it drives us towards a refined and enhanced conversation. The questions that I want to ask people, the questions that I want to ask our leaders of this country or the citizens, you know, what is the impact on a nation and its war fighters after nearly 20 years of sustained combat in war? I don't think anybody has any idea the impact, but we have to talk about it. What's the impact on our citizens? What's the impact on our society? What's our long-term strategy for victory? And to me, the most interesting question is, can sustained warfare bend a soul and morality? Can it turn a good man or woman into an evil one? And I'm not smart enough to give you answers to any of those questions. But I think that they're the ones that we should be asking and demanding answers for. For us to have a discussion, you have to be able to listen and attempt to understand the other side. This country seems to be defined by the left and the right. And when we define ourselves by that, I don't think a conversation or communication is even possible. So hopefully, what I would like is to find some common middle ground with which we can actually have these conversations. Because at the end of the day, if you define yourself by the left or the right, I think you're wrong. When people ask me that question, are you a Democrat or a Republican? Are you on the left or the right? I give them an answer that they don't want because it doesn't give them a talking point. Because my answer is I'm not on the left or the right or a Democrat or a Republican. I consider myself to be an American. And I care about this country and every single person that lives inside of it. So maybe we can put our differences aside a little bit, talk a little bit more, yell at each other a little bit less. And that's all I have for the week. Thank you again to Fields for supporting Cleared Hot. Fields has me feeling my best every day, and it can help you too. Become a member today by going to fields.com slash cleared hot, and you will get 50% off your first order with free shipping. Also, thank you to Duke Cannon for supporting this episode of Cleared Hot. Get 15% off your first order and free shipping on orders over $35 at DukeCannon.com with the promo code Cleared Hot, all one word. And that's it for this week, everybody. The new t-shirts are up on ClearedHotPodcast.com. Hit the shop tab. And that's all I got. See you next Monday.